Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to give it another minute or two to allow for any uh, last minute attendees to join up here. Please bear with us. All right, everybody, 201, I'm gonna kick this thing off again. Everybody, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, if you do have any questions during the webinar, please feel welcome to put it into the question slot on your tab. We will do a quick Q&A after the webinar finishes up and there will be slides and the actual um, recording of the webinar available after the fact. So don't feel like you have to rush through and take a bunch of notes as we will be distributing them after the fact. Today's webinar today is a sales and marketing webinar on selling, promoting, and using energy storage in your business. So that being said, um, a few things about who we are here at Fortress Power is we're a lithium iron phosphate battery manufacturer based outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, in a small town called Southampton. Southampton's around 30, uh, 30, 35 minutes northwest of the city of Philadelphia, and we were founded back in 2016 and were owned by a group of investment bankers and solar veterans. So as you guys see here on the right, this is our facility. It's a 30,000 square foot facility where you do a lot of the R&D, sales and logistics. And that being said, being a Pennsylvania based company, we do have two other warehouses, one down in Texas and another one in Florida. Batteries. I will touch base in the next couple of slides on the growth of batteries um, in the past couple of years. And we've certainly seen this and we've done installations um, not only in the continental US, but also in Canada, the Central Caribbean, South America, Europe, the Middle East and Africa. We are the key battery supplier for SEPTA, which is a local railway company um, based outside of Philadelphia here. Hydro Quebec, which is a Canadian utility company using our E-Flex batteries for an interesting application. And the Navajo Reservation, where they're using E-Vaults um, as a backup source in a uh, very large scale, um, like off-grid site application. So certainly seen a lot of growth and we've had a lot of experience with batteries since our inception back in 2016. So that being said, we do have a lot of topics that I'd like to cover today. Um, should be around 40 to 45 minutes or so, and then we'll reserve the last 10 to 15 for Q&A. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the market trends of where batteries have been and then where they're headed into the next five, 10 years. We'll look at some lithium deployment applications, different applications on which you can use batteries. Adding storage to your business, what does it take to add energy storage to your business? What steps would we recommend over here at Fortress Power? some different uh, selling tips as well as key selling tips for promoting energy storage in your business. And then what else we can do on the Fortress Power side to support you as you use batteries in general or the Fortress Power line. So that being said, I'm gonna jump right into a new Department of Energy analysis that was recently released regarding energy storage in the coming years. They mentioned that by 2030, stationary deployments will exceed 150 gigawatt hours meaning that there's gonna be seen a 27% annual growth for grid-related storage applications. So if you guys look at this uh, nifty graph here on the right-hand side, Fortress Power falls into the stationary energy storage for like homes and businesses. And you see here, where's my mouse? In 2021, 
Uh, by the end of this decade, they're going to see uh, almost 150 gigawatt hours of deployment. So uh, five times over, we're going to see growth by 2030. And the largest market of this growth is going to be North America with a whopping 41.1 gigawatt hours forecasted and stationary energy um, storage. So certainly a lot of growth. And even if we look at the last four years from 2018 to 2021, certainly there's been a lot of growth and awareness on batteries just in the past four years. So that being said, why are we seeing this? Why is the Department of Energy forecasting for such exponential growth over the next nine years? I like to say it comes down to three key factors. And the first one being the battery affordability. So if we look at the trend of what solar has done over the past five, 10 or 15 years, the cost of solar alone has dropped over 20% in just the past five years. And they're seeing a similar trend with energy storage that by 2029, they're gonna see a 46% price reduction in lithium battery cells. So obviously in like a su supply and demand curve as the price goes down and demand goes up, this is gonna push for more energy, um, energy storage uh, deployment. Next, we have the rising incentives. So there was an extension of the federal ITC tax credit of 26%. It was not stepped down to 22%, which will be valid through 2022. And there's also more statewide incentives for solar and energy storage than there's ever been. A few that come to mind is the SGIP incentive, which is popular in California, the GMP incentive, and other statewide rebate programs. Depending on where you're located, I would recommend that you check out desire.org, which is D-S-I-R-E.org. This is a really, really handy website, depending on what state you're in, to see what kind of incentives, uh, rebate programs they may have for solar and solar batteries. So the pricing is coming down. There are more incentives. And then lastly, we're seeing a shifting mindset from what was traditional thinking into now this new thinking about what a battery actually is. The first thing is fear. Uh, the next slide is very interesting, but the once in every 500 year storm, that is no longer the case. Storms are becoming more prevalent, more consistent, um, and they're also becoming a lot stronger. We see here, according to the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, the average Atlantic hurricane season is actually being projected from 12 named storms to 14 named storms, six hurricanes to seven hurricanes, and the number of major hurricanes is not changing. But if you were to run a statistical analysis on their new numbers that they posted, this means over the course of a year, we're gonna see upwards of you know, hundreds of storms just with their new projections. So because of things like climate change, these storms, although maybe less frequent, are becoming more powerful, and they have certainly an impact on people um, in certain areas. We know about that unfortunate situation in Texas um, that happened a few weeks ago. So fear is really driving people to look at what kind of backup sources can they use for their home or business. The second thing here that we're seeing is this high emphasis on renewables. So because of what I mentioned, lots of storms, climate change, people are now more aware of using clean technology to do the same job in a, um, instead of using fossil fuels or another technology. So this high emphasis on renewables, whether it's on the consumer side or on the business side uh, or on the corporate side even, this emphasis on renewables is what's also pushing more battery deployment or that forecast. And then last but not least, with the recent political administration change, this is also pushing for more legislature, more rebates for batteries, more incentives for solar and solar storage. So all in all, when you look at the battery affordability, more incentives because of the political administration change and other factors, and a new mindset of what a solar and solar battery can do, this is part of the reason I feel that the Department of Energy is forecasting for such exponential growth in energy storage in the next 10 years. So that being said, for more information on the NOAA and how they find their numbers regarding the average Atlantic hurricane season, recommend you guys check out this link here. Um, they have a very nice breakdown. And obviously when you get the slides, you'll be able to just click right on this and head on over to their website. So let's jump into some of the different applications that you can use a battery for. So the typical application is you can back up your facility. So normally without a battery and you have solar, if the grid goes down, then your solar stops producing. Now you can eliminate that by adding a battery 
um, and per the NEC code, without a battery has to stop, but with a battery, it'll keep your system running. You can use this for self-supply. So you could have PV and a battery where the grid is prohibiting back feed or net metering to maximize your PV production and make sure you're not losing any excess production from your solar array. You can also have your customer save their money on electric bills. So charging the batteries at off-peak times and discharging them during peak times, otherwise known as time of use billing. This is very popular in like Southern California, where from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. it may be 20 cents a kW, but from those peak times from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. it might be 40, 60, or even 70 cents a kW for a year electricity used. And in addition to being able to be used in your typical grid backup, self-supply where they're not allowing that metering, time of use, or off-grid, like I mentioned earlier, it is eligible with a lot of the taxes and incentives, like the 26% ITC tax credit if it's powered by solar, along with other state and utility rebate programs. Quick overview of how a battery would look in different applications. Here's your typical off-grid application, right? No utility here. You have PV with a battery. Maybe you have a backup generator as a backup to the backup where your solar and battery are really the only two things um, powering the loads in your home. Next, you have the backup situation. So where you have a connection to the grid, but if the grid goes down over here, then you use the battery in addition to be to PV to feed the electrical loads in that person's home. Um, these electrical loads could be something as simple as the critical loads or the important loads like refrigerators, um, sump pump, well pump, uh, Wi-Fi, things like that. Or depending on the size of your battery, you can set it up for a whole home backup, but no, it does require a rather large battery. That being said, in the time of use, uh, it's the same kind of setup here where you can purchase or sell back to the grid, but what you'll notice is that they'll charge the battery, like I said, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then 4 p.m. comes around, battery is told by the hybrid inverter to discharge to the loads. So that way you can achieve the maximum ROI for your battery bank in that way. And then last but not least, the self-supply application. So if you look at our handy chart here on the right, this is where the grid is available for purchase, but it's not available for sale. You can't sell back. So any excess production of your solar array, if it's not going into a battery, um, it can't be sold back. So you're essentially losing it. So having a battery here, capture your excess production of your PV array, and then use that and discharge the battery for those loads, maybe at night, maybe at certain times a day, however you set it up for your personal home. Now adding storage to your business. So a lot of different installers, contractors, and everybody in between wants to know uh, what do I need basically to kick off adding energy storage to your business or adding a new product if you're familiar with energy storage as is? So what is the impact first and foremost if we work backwards of adding batteries to your business? First thing is more revenue. So you have opportunities for more projects and higher margins and up to 30% growth for those projects in your business for adding storage um, to those. Whether it's like a grid tight application or off grid, you can see that Department of Energy analysis, you really wanna make sure that you're catching on with that growth. I say opportunities for projects because more people are maybe inquiring about a battery system and solar for their home and you wanna be able to have packages available for them so you become the second point here, a battery expert. The impact is the marketing reach as you get more referrals, the word of mouth spreads about your business and batteries, you will become known as the battery expert, which means more business in your pipeline, in your queue for you to either work with and pass along them a solution. And the impact if you do not add batteries onto your storage is probably not seen immediately, but it's kind of like what I mentioned in the Department of Energy slides, you're missing out on that 27% annual growth and the largest stationary energy storage market in the world being North America. So certainly a very good idea to consider batteries for projects if you haven't already. And if you have, and you're already using batteries, this is really just putting the nail in the coffin that using a battery for your projects, having it on your line card is a very good idea. So getting started, what do you need for your typical battery project? First thing that you would typically do is go on your site visit. See 
where, where is your customer located? Figure out the potential solar array size. Are they going to do a ground mount system? Are they going to do a roof mount system? How are they going to set this system up? And then you want to figure out the load profile and application. So I went through a few of those different applications earlier. Does your customer want an off-grid application? Do they want to use this for emergency power? Are they in an area where they're getting a charge a lot of money during a certain time? So figure out their solar array size and the application, and then walk them through what loads they want powered. What is their load profile? So if you see here on the right, figure B, it's really as easy as selecting the loads to be moved from the main panel to the backup panel, the loads they want powered in the outage, also known as a critical load panel. Calculate that daily usage of the backup load panel. How long do they want it backed up? What is their time of autonomy or days of duration of backup? Select the appropriate battery bank size, and then estimate the daily available power after the battery is charged. So that way they know, based on my solar production and the size of my battery, will I need to maybe be cautious about how I'm using my battery? Do I need to maybe consider um, purchasing some of my electricity through the utility, depending on the situation? So it's a very good idea to take these first few steps because it can really help you paint a picture on what battery you will need. Second thing is goes hand in hand with this site visit is figuring out your customer profile. Know your customer, figure out what kind of application they want to use it for, like the off-grid, like I mentioned, and then really know what is their gap. Where are they now? And then where do they want to be? A lot of this can be found through probing and asking a lot of very good questions. Questions could include, you know, what kind of things are you worried about? What have you seen in your area? What are, what are your neighbors talking about that's making you make this decision? Figuring out what their gap is, where they are versus where they want to be can really help everybody avoid over-promising and under-delivering. So know that gap because then you, don't, you will prevent buyer's remorse moving forward. Secondly, figure out the, uh, well, thirdly, technically, figure out the budget and timeline of this project. You don't want to pro, uh, propose a a uh, glamorous large battery and realize that their budget is not in line with the battery size that you're quoting along with the timeline of their project. Both are very important. At Fortress Power, we do have stock available now. Now, granted, not all of their battery companies have the stock available. If they need something more readily available than not, how is that going to impact how you communicate with them along with uh, what expectations they have for what the battery is going to do when they're going to get their battery. Which brings me to my next point, managing the expectations to prevent over-promising and under-delivering. So obviously when you're sizing a battery, you don't want to just say, hey, this is a whole home backup without even running your load calcs because that's, that's textbook over-promising and under-delivering. As being in sales, we want to prevent buyer's remorse. We want to make sure we manage expectations with the end user on A, what this battery is, B, how they can use the battery to their benefit, and C, any other information that would make them a more informed buyer. Now, that being said, today's buyers are more educated than ever with access to the internet. So a lot of managing expectations will be conferring or confirming what they're seeing um, on the internet, whether it's reviews, whether it's scholarly articles, to manage those expectations of the actual project and how it's done. You know, something written on paper is certainly different than a real life battery and solar project. And then after you figure out, you go on site, you determine the solar array size, where the solar is going to go, the application and load profile, the customer's gap, the budget and timeline, and then you manage their expectations, review the project scope with the customer, let them know, I'm taking these steps to get you to where you want to be. This is how I'm doing it, and this is why I'm doing it. I've always gotten very interesting feedback that um, there have been companies that didn't give a lot of this information. They just sold the system to sell the system, which ultimately you may get the deal, but at the end of the day, you're going to get repeated phone calls. You're going to get emails, more site visits. That means more truck rolls, which ultimately costs money. So reviewing the project scope with your customer at the end of the day to manage those expectations for the budget and timeline and their gap and kind of work backwards can avoid those extra touches that you'll need down the road. And instead, they will be able to function and avoid essentially all that back and forth communication, which costs time and money. So that's so some different tips I like to recommend um, in regards to selling storage along with your solar proposals, um, using keywords like payback, 
security, safety, value, longevity, and the fact that energy storage is a safe, tangible investment. Power is more important than it's ever been. Having access to power, having power for your family, for your business is more important than it's ever been because of all the storms that we're seeing, high utility rates, et cetera, et cetera. So use some of these keywords here on the top left and really try and communicate to them, this is a safe, tangible investment that you can have and see in your home. References and incentives are an excellent way um, in terms of like word of mouth marketing to gain more market share. Use customer references, use success stories, just like we do here at Fortress Power with our installer base on using, whether it's solar storage, a certain battery, whether it's Fortress or another option, Use those references to your advantage to create a very nice, easy way that people can know how you run your business and why it's a good idea to choose you. The incentives, like I mentioned, like the 26% ITC tax credit and different statewide incentives, now is the perfect time to be using solar and storage before this 26% ITC tax credit goes away. So almost uh, a quarter of the project budget will be basically, a, not a race, but paid for by the federal government with this 26%. So now is a perfect time to invest in solar and solar storage. I get asked a lot, what kind of objections um, do you see from the homeowners or end user when they're looking at batteries? Now, the first thing here is pricing or financing. Batteries are not a cheap item, but what you can say is the price is indicative of the quality of the battery. A lot of these batteries, Fortress for example, has a 10 year warranty with a 6,000 cycle uh, rating. Meaning that if you cycle your battery one time a day, it's gonna last anywhere from 12 to 15 years. So yes, you're paying a little bit more than maybe a traditional lead acid, but you're also getting double, maybe even in some instances triple the lifespan when investing in a lithium battery. And in terms of price, there's also different financing options available. Um, with Fortress that you can consider. So uh, Loan Pal is a really popular one, Sunlight Financial, Enerbank USA, Lightstream, and Mosaic Finance. So use the Fortress Power financing options if the customer is not just gonna hand over cash over fist for the project. Second objection I typically hear is I'll wait, right? They, they, want, they read the Department of Energy analysis and they'll say, well, I'm gonna wait for the price to come down. Well, I'm gonna wait for the technology to get better. Um, I'm sure we've all heard all these before. I usually like to say the longer you wait, you're not benefiting from the longevity of the battery. You're not able to collect your ROI on that battery if you keep waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like when investing, they want you to start investing as soon as possible. They don't want you to invest when the market starts getting good because the sooner you get in, the more it can compound and actually be better in the long term. And batteries are certainly a long term investment as you know, 10 years per the warranty. A decade. You know, that's a long time for anybody. And if now is not the time for your customer, let's say they are just not having it, you could always install the solar first and sell for the future. Always recommend install the solar first, show them that you know what you're doing, and then reapproach them three months down the road, six months down the road. Maybe wait till they see or they have some kind of experience where a battery would have been helpful. And you can re engage them and say, hey, I wanted to see would a battery make sense for you now. You have the solar, you're either net metering or X, Y, and Z, sell for the future. Don't just cut it off once you have the solar sold because you might be able to get another couple touches in to educate on batteries and then install a battery down the road. Now, I usually recommend on the battery side, on the product side, which I'll be jumping in here, into here next, um, if you have, let's say, the Evolve and they put the Evolve in January 1st, 2022. If they want to add another Evolve, we would recommend doing that within one year of that installation. So let's say the project is calling for two Evolves, but they only have the budget for one. Sell the one and then reapproach them and say, listen, within one year, you can add a second Evolve on. So it makes it feel like they're not being pressured into getting two Evolves at this moment, let's say. And also it's going to fulfill the load profile in their home. So now is not that time, sell for the future, sell for the promise, sell the vision of what this battery can do. Use different experiences, like I mentioned. That being said, remember those financing companies, always a very good resource um, on that side of things. 
And let's take a look at some of the different inverters we work with. There's a lot of inverter companies out there and there's a lot of battery companies out there. Not one battery or inverter can fit all the different project applications out there. So you'll see some familiar names on this list like Solar, Schneider, Outback, Magnum, SMA, Victron, Morningstar, and Midnight. And we are um, establishing closed loop communication. We actually have it confirmed with the Solark and Schneider as of now and are testing with the SMA inverter. I have a little um, blurb at the end of the presentation on what closed loop communication is and why it's important. So here is our line. So from left to right, we have the LFP5 and LFP10, two of our older products that we used to hold. And now we really focus on the Evolt 18.5 and the eFlex 5.4. So the Evolve 18.5 is our flagship product, let's say, and it's 18.5 kilowatt hours of total capacity and can stack up to 12 for 220 kilowatt hours. So that's why I usually say we're, we're really ranged in the small residential to small commercial space. You can see here it does have live monitoring on the system with a, a fully functional LCD display. So the customer right then there can look at the voltage of their battery, what their state of charge is at of their evolve, the power um, along with the current. And you can see here, it's, it is hard to see, but it will also show you how many batteries are in parallel with, let's say you have eight, then this number in the bottom right would say parallel number eight. So that being said, very uh, local LCD monitoring is a huge hit on this because people love being able to look right at the front of their battery and know what's going on. This is SGIF approved for my California installers at 17.7 kilowatt hours of AC, meaning that it is really the biggest bang for your buck here on the market. Uh, and then we transition over here to our newest product, the E-Flex 5.4, the little sibling to the Evol 18.5. It's our more modular approach to a battery than obviously the large Evol. E-Flex has a, a lot of really neat features um, that I'd like to highlight. The first thing is that closed loop data communication that I mentioned with those inverters seen on this slide. It also will have remote monitoring of each battery pack, single cell management and monitoring. And it comes with a cell to pack architecture and an aluminum IP65 enclosure, meaning that this unit is outdoor rated. The E-Vault is just an indoor rated unit. The E-Flex is an outdoor rated unit or indoor rated unit. Keep that in mind as I know some jurisdictions are becoming more stringent with outdoor versus indoor installed batteries. Comes with an integrated heatsink for five times better thermal performance. And we do have a neat supercharge feature where it can charge and discharge in 45 minutes. Now, I, I don't recommend that you use this supercharge feature like every day. I always recommend it's really for emergencies. Let's say like a medical emergency or another emergency where they need that 45 minute supercharge feature. The reason I say that is because if you, let's say, use this supercharge feature every day, it would kill the life cycle of the battery. So we usually recommend just for emergencies on the supercharge feature. And it is a little corny, but the flexibility of the E-Flex, <laughs> hence the name, um, really makes it so you can use it in many different kinds of projects. So obviously in home energy storage systems, RV applications, telecommunication applications, computer server power backup applications and railway applications. And because of its flexible size, it's smaller, more modular size and outdoor indoor rated, you can install this on the wall, on the floor, or even into like a, a 24 inch standard server rack. So depending on if it's in a garage and you need to hang it on the wall, this is the product that you could use for that. Because maybe the E-Vault is just too big. So you can see here, I have the E-Flex and E-Vault right behind me. You can see it's like the size of a briefcase or so. And I always mention that the E-Vault is like a, uh, a college dorm refrigerator. So imagine that size as you're moving it around, whether it's in the garage, utility room, basement, outside, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a really interesting, I got a really interesting question the other day regarding the enclosure that we use. And I figured it makes sense for me to mention it here on why we choose aluminum as our enclosure of choice versus a plastic or iron enclosure. So both of these uh, are an aluminum enclosure behind me. And the main thing is that they're salt waterproof, meaning that for um, my, my clients down in the Caribbean or on the coast, having the salt water proof is extremely valuable to prevent, you know, um, 
any kind of rusting or any kind of you know chipping away of the uh, the plastic or iron that would otherwise happen. It also has a nice aesthetic. It looks good. It also feels good, which is a kind of a weird thing, but you can feel the difference in the quality of material, and you can also see it. Outdoor rated, obviously, and easy and flexible install with the different sizes. So the E Flex parallels up to 15 for 80 kilowatt hours. So anywhere from that small residential to mid-sized residential. And then you have the E-Vault here, the larger product for like those uh, either mid-sized residential to small commercial. So that's why we chose the aluminum enclosure versus a plastic or iron case, because typically in high salt environments, there is corrosion that can occur. They are typically only indoor rated only unless they figure out some kind of cabinet that they can stick it in. And they also can be more time consuming to install because imagine instead of one larger battery, you're paralleling many smaller batteries together. That's more balance of systems costs, it's more labor costs, and it's more time on site instead of wheeling in one big, beautiful battery. As you can see here, Evolt does come with wheels and little stands. And if you're in an area where they require a seismic requirement, there is an L bracket that you can get for the E-Vault and L bracket it to the wall. I had one around here somewhere, but I definitely lost it. So just as an FYI, there is an L bracket if your customer wanted to bracket this to the wall, um, but the wheels do lock into place if that's not the case. And the main thing here uh, I wanted to mention on the battery management system is this difference between a digital processor-based BMS and then what other battery options uses a MOSFET-based BMS. This is going to tie into the closed loop communication aspect of this, where our BMS allows the battery and inverter to talk with one another. There's also no manually inputting parameter settings because the closed loop communication has them preset in there. The digital processor base, this is a Fortress Power BMS out of the box. It's the highest quality battery management system up to the automotive standard um, in terms of just how it's designed and the functionality of it. It's a very safe BMS with a solid state relay and fuse that can physically open and close. It's a mechanical fuse and has a very high input and output power with a very uh, good like safety notification and response to any inverter inrush current. Obviously, as solar arrays get larger and inverters get larger, having a more robust BMS to, uh, to accommodate for that is certainly very important. On the other hand, you have a MOSFET-based BMS, which is essentially a piece of circuitry that usually lays on top of the battery, um, probably the cells, maybe on another, another uh, rack maybe. And the thing here is that it's a little bit of a cheaper BMS, but there is, that, there is that potential for thermal runaway because it doesn't have the robustness and the input-output power of the digital processor-based BMS. And because of that, of the format of this and it just being a circuit board, there is the possibility that a very high inrush current that the BMS could fail. So I always like to mention regarding uh, battery management systems with, with whichever battery option that you're going with, ask them, what kind of BMS are you using in your battery? Is it a digital processor based? Is it a MOSFET based? And the all important question of why, why do they choose this solution? How does it play into their product model? Um, and I know at Fortress, we chose a digital processor based because our batteries are very large and they're typically used for larger projects. So BMS is very important, digital processor versus MOSFET. We have a very good service for our distributors and installers. We have a hands-on management team, personalized client relations. We can also help out with code marketing support and leads, design and installation support. So I know earlier in the presentation, I went through how to size a battery, um, let's say a Fortress battery for your project. If you'd like to confirm this with us, shoot me over an email, I'll have my contact information. And Alex, I'm designing a system, I put a disk battery. Can you confirm that this battery would work for this customer and their application? Always welcome to do that. We have on-site technical support available that you can just call in. We're also releasing our newest platform, um, which is the Discord. So there is more information on our website on the Discord platform that we have for technical support, whether on-site or general questions. And we can do drop shipments at request for um, products on-site. We did just release our new loyalty program. 
uh, very exciting stuff here. And there's a lot of different benefits for being not only a certified Fortress Power installer, but also signing up with our loyalty program. So there's going to be more sales opportunities as customer requests come directly to the Fortress Power site. You're going to get first hand Fortress Power updates with product information, company news, industry news. You're gonna have technical, live technical support via Discord or just emailing in or calling into our team. Sales support from yours truly or someone else on my sales team for training and webinar trainings, just like the one we're doing here today. You'll have your own microsite eventually on our website or you'll have your company name. You can have pictures and contact information. That way, when the end user goes on our website and they're looking for a Fortress Power installer, you are there first and foremost. They know this is my guy. I'm going to contact him for a battery. And then you start working through getting them on the site visit, et cetera, et cetera. You'll have access to marketing material, other known as swag, stuff we all get, um, including different brochures and data sheets. And then obviously the loyalty program, you'll get points on installations and different prizes. So really exciting here with our new loyalty program. I'm thrilled to have released it um, as of the past few weeks. So we have personalized support here. It's one of the reasons we get a lot of very good feedback from a lot of our installers. Uh, we are on Discord, which is what our technical support team uses. And they are live as well if you'd like to call them here. And we do have people available to talk to while on site, just sizing your battery. So that being said, and here's my contact information down here. And then you, for any other sales inquiries or technical support or any warranty submissions, you can always email these respective emails as they can certainly help you get, get you in the right direction. So that being said, I think that's, yep, that's all I had for you guys here today. So I will open the floor for a Q&A right now. Um, let me uh, just- Alex, you. I have some questions right here from a couple of people. Great. Uh, so the first one is, um, is the inverter AVL open to add, ch uh, it says chin power systems. Can you repeat that, Jamie? I'm sorry. I was having sure. trouble hearing. Is the inverter AVL open to add CHINT power system, chint power systems? Chint power systems. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a good question. I would contact the inverter, um, that particular inverter manufacturer. Um, I do not know. I know typically um, they're usually open to it for like an AVL, but you might just want to ask that particular inverter manufacturer, especially with something like Chint to get that kind of uh, that kind of partnership. If that answers your question. Okay. Uh, next question is: What kind of an app does Fortress Evolt have for monitoring SOC mm -hmm. draw time to full, etc.? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So the Evolt has that local monitoring on it, so you can see the state of charge right on the front of it. Now, we are working on a Fortress Power app, not sure when it's going to be released. However, on the inverter side, I always recommend you can get monitoring through the inverter to find the state of charge of the battery bank. For example, if you're using like a Solark or Schneider or Outback, they have very nice online platforms that you could see the monitoring of the solar along with the battery. So the simple answer is nothing on the actual Fortress side, but the inverter companies we partnered up with do have something like that set up. Okay, uh, Raymond is asking, are there training sessions for my electricians? Yeah, absolutely. So you can either set one up with your respective Fortress Power Rep or check out our YouTube channel. Just go on the YouTube, we have a nice channel and there's all sorts of videos on there. Sales videos, just like this one, there's installation videos, um, there's installation tips on how to install the eFlex, for example. So if there's a uh, more immediate need, check out our YouTube channel, another very good resource, or schedule one with your particular representative and they can work with you just like this. Okay, uh, Roy has a question. I build a typical 150 kilowatt AC 500 panel ground mounts with SMA inverters. Is okay. your new small battery applicable to this system with numbers of batteries mounted on racking? Is there control of multiple batteries? So, based, so because of the BMS, there will be a control of many batteries. Now, my only thing here, 150 kW is quite a large solar array. So we actually might not have a large enough battery for that kind of application. Just general sizing guidance, everybody. You want your battery to be double the size of the inverter. 
for like the array. So for example, if you have a 10 kW array, a good starting point is to have your battery be around 20 kilowatt hours. So you can have it in the, in the BMS and the eFlex allows the batteries communicate with the inverter and between batteries in parallel. But for your project, this ground mount project, it, I don't think um, we have a large enough battery to fulfill that. If you want to send it over to sales at fortresspower.com or just send it on over to me, I can confirm that for you. Let you know, hey, maybe you need to check out another battery, but it does have that feature. Okay, next question um, is from Samer. Will it tolerate extreme Middle East weather in summertime uh, up to 55C outdoor temperature? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So most phosphate uh, battery manufacturers will recommend to put the temperature range between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in the Middle East, like in some parts of the US, like Arizona, it gets really hot. Um, hot temperatures are actually not as bad for batteries as colder temperatures, which is, I think, you know, me being an optimist is a good thing. Um, the only thing is that if it is in that outdoor temperature day in and day out, that could have adverse effects on the battery. If it gets up above that 113 degree Fahrenheit temperature once in a while, that won't have an adverse effect because it's not day in and day out. If there is something we're expecting it to face high temperatures every day, then we could look at some kind of cooling system, maybe putting this indoors somewhere so it stays in that temperature range. Okay. Uh, David is asking, is Fortress Power suitable to use with microinverters? Great question. Um, as of now, I'm going to... Okay, it's not working. Um, as of now, the no, you have to use a hybrid inverter that I mentioned to hook up to like an N phase or an AP system. So you can typically do this with AC coupling. So you can AC couple from the N phase system, let's say, to a hybrid inverter like the Schneider or Solark, and then from that hybrid inverter down to our battery bank. It obviously is not as efficient and you need that extra piece of equipment, but I've seen this done because people will want phosphate batteries over something like a lithium cobalt battery because of the advantages of the life expectancy, the cycle life, and the safety, obviously. So I hope that helps. Okay. Angel is asking, how many E-Flex batteries can work with a Schneider Context XW6848? Mm -hmm. You can put as many E-Flexes as you want. There's no, there are battery, we have a recommended battery sizing for a minimum battery size. So I think with the Schneider, for example, you can set up the E-Flexes and Schneider in closed loop communication. Uh, we might recommend three E-Flexes with the Schneider for proper sizing, but there is no limitation to how large you can make the battery bank as you can put on 10 of the E-Flexes. Now note, if you did have one 6.8 kW inverter and let's say 10 E-Flexes for like 54 kilowatt hours, um, I like the water and bucket analogy. You know, it might just take longer to charge your batteries because you still have the same gauge hose. It's like one hose with one bucket is going to charge is going to take less time to fill versus one hose of the same size with eight buckets. So no limitation, but expect longer charging times because you're filling more buckets. Okay, uh, Jeff is asking, what are our next steps to becoming a certified installer? Yeah, absolutely. So head on over to www.fortresspower.com. There is an authorized dealer page. Fill out your information. It'll get sent directly to me over at the sales at fortresspower.com. Upon your sending in of this dealer form, one of our reps will be in touch to confirm that your form was received, onboard you on with our dealer package, and then work with you on a case-by-case -case basis for any upcoming projects in your queue or any projects that you're putting together a design for. Okay, I think these are all the questions we have. Um, oh, I have a couple more coming in. Uh, David is asking, what is the largest battery system Fortress Power has in operation? Oh, oh boy. Um, I saw one uh, a while ago, it was 90 volts. So if we do some quick math, um, I won't do it in my head, nine times 18.5, 166 kilowatt hours. I just looked, I'm working with one of my installers on one for 11 e volts and 12 e volts. So the largest one is probably anywhere from 9 to 11 e volt systems, which are like um, 166 kilowatt hours to 
uh, like 200 kilowatt hours. Okay, that's all I got. Okay, great. I'll, I'll let's give another second. Um, wait for mm -hmm. any last minute questions that come in here. Um, and like I said, everybody, we will have the slides and recording of this sent out after the fact. So if there is something um, that you want to review here on these slides that you just want to double check or use these slides as you go out and meet with your customers because you think slide eight works really well, feel welcome to do that as well. We want to support you as much as we can um, for your projects. Great. Uh, last question, Adam is asking, how is closed loop communication with Outback coming along? Uh, great question. Um, I know as of now, we're trying to confirm it with SMA first. I know Outback is on our list. Um, I unfortunately don't have much of a better update than that. I know it is on our list for testing, but I know SMA was the first in line and we're doing that. So I think after SMA, Outback will probably come after that. I know also Victron was on our list um at some point as well so that might be coming through but i know sma first and foremost is the priority okay um thank you everybody this concludes our webinar for today if you have any other questions um, we will be in touch with everyone tomorrow with a recording of the webinar along with all of these slides and if you have any other questions please let us know through sales at fortresspower.com thank you thank you everybody for joining and have a great rest of your day